Happy Sunday. I hope, I hope everyone's feeling good. I know we're small in number, but I hope the fire in our hearts hasn't gone down. I hope the fire in our hearts hasn't gone down. Well, first off, I'd like to thank Danny and Taylor Garner. I know they're out there in Michigan um, for just trusting me, giving me the opportunity to preach the word today. It's good to see on, some bro. new faces. Good to see you, bro. Um, good to see you back as well. Um, but I'm just honored to, to be able to preach the word today. Um, we're going to be in the book of Acts. I'm excited to continue the Son of God series that we've been doing. Um, so with that, are y'all ready to jump into ready. the Word of God? Y'all ready for a Bible study this morning? All right, cool. Starting in Acts 22. All right. Let's go, bro. Starting from verse 1. It reads, Brothers and sisters, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Amen. You may be seated. So this is, this is about to be a meaty a meaty chapter. Okay, feed us, bro. But before we go any further, we need some context, right? Yeah, so let's let's go to Acts 20. We're gonna do a little recap um, on what has happened so far. So last week, we we read a little bit about Paul's journey, right, through through Greece and Macedonia. So he traveled through that area, starting from verse two in chapter 20. It says he traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. There's a saying I know growing up, they, they'd say like, they like to pray on my downfall. None of, I don't believe not too many of us have gone through that, right? Like Paul really has here. People were actually plotting his death but in that same chapter, Danny talked about the meaning of names, right? He went through these specific individuals that were sons, right? And the importance of who is around us, right? And, and what that means in our group. We, we know that bad company corrupts good character, right? So going through this list of men that served alongside Paul as he was going from one place to the next shows us, too, the importance of the people that we roll with, the people yeah, that we do absolutely. life with. Moving forward, going down to verse 18, Paul then calls up a meeting of the elders in Ephesus because he is preparing his journey back to Jerusalem to preach the word. So he leaves them with some love and with some warnings as well. If we go to verse 18, it says, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared that to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. That's intense. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task. The Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's yeah. grace. Come on, Toby. Now I know that none of, you, none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Wow. This is crazy, right? Paul knew what was ahead of him and it wasn't good, right? Yeah. From a practical standpoint, you could say death was at his doorstep. Mm -hmm. But he had his confidence in Christ. 
right? Which is so awesome. It says, without hesitation, I publicly preach to you in the synagogues, in the homes. I know if fear was ahead of me, if, if death was ahead of me, the odds of me trying to be that confident would be very slim, right? Thank God we have Jesus. Though. Okay. He, knew, he knew where his home was. He knew where his, his heart really was and was able to preach boldly to the people in Ephesus, boldly to the people in Macedonia, and now on his way to Jerusalem. Another thing that we see here is Paul's lifestyle, right? It says that you knew what I was about, right? I didn't, I didn't come here to play. I came here to preach the word, and you saw it through my life. It goes on later to say that my hands are actually clean. I've spoken everything I need to say to you about what it means to be a disciple, about what it means to have repentance right. in Christ. I'm on to this next chapter, and you may not see me anymore. So take hold of what I've given you, right? The same thing with us as we are going through this life, whether you've come to the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life or are on the way to, that same truth stands, right? What does it mean when God has presented you with an opportunity? To stake your claim in your faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Stake your confidence in what God has shown you yeah. and move forward in that. Come on. So now we go on to Acts 21. Come on, come on. Come on Toby. Paul has now left the church in Ephesus and is on his way to Jerusalem to preach boldly, knowing that, again, he might not make it back. He probably won't make it back to the people that he just left. And in verse 10... Through 14, it reads, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When, he heard, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will. These are some real ride or die friends, right? This is like the actual definition. Here's Paul getting a prophecy, right? From, from It's like Maku coming up to me, taking his belt off and be like, this is how you're going to be bound up, Toby. Right? And I have to sit with that reality, knowing what's ahead of me. But Paul did so confidently. It's like, yo, y'all are making this worse by crying. I need, I need to go to this next part of the mission, right? And for him to be able to be so bold, it's, it's an opportunity for us to see that as an example, right? He's going to arrive in Jerusalem with this confidence and see so many things ahead of him. And, and we, in our similar ways, when we go to work, right? When, we, when we're in our homes, when we're going back to our, our different places of, of our spheres of influence, having that same confidence that while we're not facing death, like Paul, we get the opportunity to have faith and confidence that God's got me. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I love about Paul throughout these next two chapters is just his willingness to see death, stare it right in the face, mm -hmm. and still say, Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. Still say, this is who I said my yes to from the beginning, and that's not going to deter me anyway. Mm -hmm. Moving on to 17, Come on. it reads... When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. 
What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay for their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in accordance to the law. So what's happening here, right? Paul has arrived in Jerusalem, and the people there are like, yo, Paul, welcome. So glad you're here. Listen, the people that you're about to meet with are super strict, right? They are really about the law. They are really about the old covenant. This talk about Jesus is not sitting well with them. So what we need you to do is abide by what the law says so that you're not kicked out, right? In a sense, being above reproach, being in a position where they can't see him doing any wrong by the reports that have already been said yeah. about him. So what he does is he shaves his head. Mm. The Bible talks about it in 1 Corinthians 9.22. Paul himself says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. Right. Yeah. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, right. though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. I know in such an individualistic society we live in, to see someone like Paul break down his idea of, you know, his like physical identity, to, to abide by this law, not be under it, but just for the sake of entering this space, right? That's, that's a reverence, right? That's a respect. And I think in a similar way, in our spheres of influence, there's a way that we present ourselves but when it comes to the word, when it comes to the gospel, when that opportunity is presented, we need to, sh we need to cut through, right? Yeah. We need to live that out in our lifestyle. Right. And that's exactly what Paul did. He's like, yo, I'm going to do what I need to do to win those in my sphere of influence. And in the same way as we read these scriptures, we need to be thinking about the same thing. How do I present myself at work, right? Do I come in late? Do I turn my stuff in in an untimely manner, right? How am I supposed to reach the next man or the next woman if I'm not, if not with them or better than them? And that's exactly what Paul was showing in his character. It's like, what you guys have done, shaving your head, purification rites, that's cool. I can do that, but I'm about to give you this word, right? And you can't say that I didn't do what I needed to do because now I'm going to lay the gospel out in full view for you to change now. So despite doing all of this, right, he came, he did the purification rites, he got, you know, he got right. The moment Paul steps on the scene, the Jews are ready to arrest him on sight. So all this stuff that he did, they're like, yo, we still heard about you. I don't care what you did. You shaved your head. It's time. We, we, we've been waiting on you, right? So let's move to verse 27. It says, when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and they seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Now imagine this visual, right? I won't say that uh, Jerusalem was maybe as big as Chicago, right? Let's use Evanston as an example, right? Penyon, you walk into Evanston. Tiara, you walk into Evanston. Christian, you walk into Evanston. And the entire city is like, oh, it's time. Grabs you and starts to drag you 
into the Capitol to beat you. And they're beating, and they're beating, and they're beating them. And then the guards come and they're like, oh, you can have your way with them. They literally did this to Paul. They dragged him from where he was. This place is in an uproar, all because of Jesus. His proclamation of Jesus. I think about where we are today in this 21st century in the United States where we're in a room like this, able to read the word publicly. And people like Paul died for our ability to be able to do that. Died for people to say no. For people to even have the chance to be like, yeah, that's cool, but I don't even want it. Imagine Paul getting whooped right in front of you, getting beaten, getting flogged. And still, someone can look at the Bible, look at what God has done for them, and be like, no, I'm good. I don't want this. And this is, this is a testament to our faith as well, right? I think it's very important to go back through books like Acts because we get to see what we didn't have to go through to be where we are, right? We didn't have to go through the beatings. We didn't have to go through the floggings. And, and that's just in, in this country. There are people that actually are going through that in other countries across the world. Yeah. And, and fortunately for us, we get the opportunity to really fight for our brothers and sisters to make sure that they're taken care of. Yeah. But back then, it was, it was Paul, and Luke was writing, and, and that was it. You know, Timothy was still waiting on him, probably in, in Ephesus. And, and that was the reality for them, right? So Paul is eventually picked up by the troops, and he's removed into the barracks. So now he's in possession, he's, he's under the possession of the Romans. In verse 37 through 40, it's now about to get a bit more real. It says, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, listen, man, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. We are now at chapter 22. Y'all like that recap? Y'all good? Y'all took some good notes? All right, it's about to get a little spicy now. All right. The title of my lesson is A Homecoming to Remember. So back to 22 in verses 1 and 2. It says, they were all silent, and he said to them in Aramaic, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him, when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any one of you. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Now imagine how surreal this had to be for Paul to speak those words. I was once one of you. I was once a Pharisee. I was once in higher ranks than some of you. You just slapped me. I used to be your OG. I used to be higher than you. I discipled you, right? He he was one of the ones, right? He was one of the people that put Jews, disciples in prison, that approved of their death, and now he's on the other side of it. Think about how God works in that way, right? The zeal rooted in sin gets turned for his glory, and now he gets a little bit of that bruising 
himself. But Paul was humble, right? He said, I was just as zealous, but here I am in a new light, in a new life, presenting to you my case. And as I was reading this, I was like, man, I think about my own past, right? And even for a moment, think about your own past, the zeal that you used to have, right? I used to be zealous for parties. I used to be zealous for women. I used to be zealous for drinking, alcohol. There's so many things that we used to be zealous for. The wrong kind of zeal, right? Yeah. Zeal misplaced is death, yeah. right? But zeal rooted in God brings glory. Yeah. And Paul understood this in his life, and that was why he started out in this way. He's like, yo, I don't, I don't judge you, right? I used to be zealous just like you. But let me show you what God did in my life. Right. Let me show you what he did, what, what he rooted me out of in order that I may be rooted in him. And sometimes in our past, that zeal can be disguised under sin, right? We can be thinking we're a good person. Oh, I, I, I you know, uh, volunteer at this nonprofit, but I turn up on the weekends once in a while. But, you know, I, I, I'm being in big brother, big sister, you know, but I do this on the side too, right? All these things that we just consider life. But in reality, it's just a sense of lukewarmth. Right? It's a lukewarmness that God is not, he's not for. He's not for that. And one of the things that, you know, where the, one of the places that my sinful zeal was the highest stat was in my undergrad years. Um, I went to Howard University. And HBCU. Funny enough, one of the biggest times of the year is called homecoming. Right? Howard homecoming. And the funny thing about this time is when people would come back home, they would wow out the most, mm -hmm. right? They would come back to campus. You'd see all these alumni as the people that were undergrad. We'd have all these day parties and we'd do all these super worldly things, right? And back then I'm thinking it's fun. I'm like, wow, this dude is 30 years old. He's got kids now. Why are you at this tailgate? <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing here? But this is, what, this is what was celebrated, right? This is what we did in this idea of coming home. And even now to this day, friends will reach out that I went to school with. And like, Yo, Toby, bro, October is coming around, bro. You coming back for homecoming? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much temptation at home, yeah. right? There's so much worldliness. There's so much <laughs> sin at home. And in a similar way, right, while that might not be your undergrad, maybe it's your neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's those friends that you used to, to kick it with. Whatever is home for you can be the very place where your zeal was in opposition wow. to God, right? And Paul understood this, but do we understand this, right? You might get that text once in a while from that friend. Are you, are you entertaining it? Are you, oh, I won't drink, I won't have, I won't, I won't do anything, but I'll just be there. What? You might as well just do it. Yeah. If you're with them, they see that, they're like, oh yeah, he's cool with them. I'm gonna call him next week. And then before you know it, you're not getting open with your brothers, you're not getting open with your sisters, and then you're in it, right? The, the cons of going home, right? Sometimes home can be super sentimental, right? You're with your family, you're having a good time, but then they start, yo, you know, you're hanging out with, you're hanging out with the kingdom a little too much. You're not, you don't need to seek them first all the time, right? All these little things that the devil can use to get us sucked back where we used to be, yeah. right? And that's the zeal. That's the zeal that we think is, is good. It's in our favor, but it's, it's really rooted in sin yeah. in the end of the day, and it's, and it's in opposition to God. So when you go back home, though, you do have a choice, right? Because we do have to go back home once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. But when you do go, what do people notice, right? Do they see your zeal for God now, mm -hmm. right? Would the transformation in your life shine bright to them, right? Would they be able to see you to a point where you're like, yo, I don't even recognize who Gio is anymore. I don't even recognize who Jossie is anymore, right? Can they be able to say that when you go back to your places, to the, the places that you have influence in? This transformed man in Paul was once a Pharisee and came back, and these guys didn't even recognize him. Like, Pharisee who? You look like one of those crazy disciples, right. and we're going to deal with you. Right. 
And he's like, look, I was once one of you. Mm. But it's not me anymore. Mm -hmm. in, in a real way, we need to be that unrecognizable yeah. through our spiritual life, through our fervor, through our willingness to, to call people higher, to love up on people. We might have come from homes where that love isn't present. So for you to be love is like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Why are you trying to hug me? Right? Why are you trying to send me verses for encouragement? Like, what is all of this? Stop. But Paul was real about this, right? And and it's this question of how does your salvation go before you? Yeah. Right? How does how does your reputation in Christ permeate the places that you walk? Right? I think about Jenny. I think about her being steadfast as a as a faithful mom, as a faithful disciple, and going home, and now Jossie's baptized, right? I think about Tim. I know he's on Zoom, but I think about how he went home, and he got his childhood friends to be baptized, right? Within like three, four months of each other. That's the homecoming that God's trying to see, right? We can give it up for that. We can give it up for that. I think about, I think about Anthony, right? I think about Natalie, how through their lives, their, their own mothers were able to see, yo, man, this is different. I've never seen my son. I've never seen my daughter in this way. Let me figure out what, what this, this Jesus dude talking about, right? And as a result, their lives have been changed forever, right? And this is exactly what we do when we hold the gospel, when we do so without fear. And, and Paul was able to stand in front of these people speaking in Aramaic and saying, this is my testimony. This is my story. So I have four points for y'all this afternoon. And the first one is hear the call of heaven. In verse 6, it says, About noon as I came near Damascus. Now Paul's talking about his story, how he came into this encounter with Christ. Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was sent speaking to me. Point one is hear the call of heaven. At this point, we need to recognize that our sinful zeal put Christ on the cross. Yeah. Right? It's easy for us to read this and be like, no, nah, for real, Paul was persecuting, though. I, I didn't do any of that. That was Paul. He was at, he was at the feet of, of Stephen, approving for, for his death. He, he did all of that. He was dragging people out of homes. I just drank a little bit. I just smoked a little weed. Or I just lied a lot, or I was just prideful. No, your pride, your immorality, your sin put Jesus on the cross. He had every right to do that to us. He could have opened the ceiling right now and did the same thing to us. That same reality of what he was speaking to Paul is what we have to come to terms with as well. But glory to God, we get and got a second chance, Amen. right? Paul was, was as good as dead and could have been as good as dead in God's eyes. But he said, you're going to be my chosen instrument. And I'm going to reveal myself to you despite what you've done to my sons and daughters. Yeah. What you've done to my family. And we need to take ownership of what God has done for us yeah. in that same way. That he would be as humble to, to let himself be put on the cross yeah. for our sake. In Hebrews 12... In verse 22, it reads, let me know when you guys are there. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion, in verse 22, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Whose names are in heaven this morning? Amen. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, 
And so the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it, this is important, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? This is an incredible scripture tied right back to this very moment with Paul. The question for us is, will we accept the call? We've heard it. Will we accept it? The scripture says, don't refuse God's call. At every single point in our lives, God has knocked on the door of our heart. He's placed that disciple on our path. He's placed that person in our, in our doorway, right? To let us know that Jesus is real, that Jesus loves us, and that he wants a deeper relationship with us. And the scripture is a straight up command. See to it that you do not refuse the call. Jesus, he only came once. He's coming again. And the next time he comes, he's like, yo, I'm coming with my glory. And for all of those people that accepted the call, let's ride. We're off. But this warning here is for those who haven't, it's going to be rough, right? It's, it's going to be a lifetime away from God. But glory to God, we have that opportunity for as long as you're breathing. Right? As long as you can smell and see and taste and wake up, God has given you that opportunity to never refuse that call Amen. again. So embrace that warning in love. God gives us these warnings to encourage us to, to do the righteous thing, right? to not stay in our home, to not stay in our sinful zeal, but to come out of ourselves and accept and embrace the call from heaven. Point number two. Operate in obedience. Turning back to the book of Acts in verse 22, starting from verse 14, it reads, Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and what you've heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So now... Paul's in Jerusalem, but when he came into contact with Jesus, he was going to be sent on a mission to the Gentiles, right? He was going to go about sharing the gospel to us, right? People who were not by birth the people of God. Glory to God that he's, he met him in Damascus on the road to say, go share with these people first. And you'll come back around. You'll come back around to Jerusalem. It'll be a different time. It'll be a different season. But when you do, you'll be a lot more powerful on the other side of that. But the question for us is, in this idea of operating in obedience, when God says go, what is our response? Yeah. Yes. Right? Yeah. In reality, Paul was, he was real about it. He's like, yo, I killed your boy Stephen. I killed so many of your family. Why me? Why am I your chosen instrument? Yeah. And God's like, listen, enough questions. Go. I gave you a command. I chose you. End of story. Yeah. Nice. You're sitting here right now because God has a plan for you. Yeah. Right? The reason why you're here today is not just to listen to me. Right. It's not just to sit next to your friend. 
It's because he gave you a specific go. And there are goes, generally speaking, right? We need to go out, make disciples of all nations. But there's a specific go, right? Maybe it's go share your faith with that specific person at your job. Maybe it's go launch that idea that's been on your heart that you keep limiting in fear. Maybe it's go, do that fast. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, this also requires a level of faithfulness, a level of boldness to, to say, in response to your call, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. In 1 John, in verse 4, because I feel like we, we, need to, we need to understand why we might not go. In verse 16, it reads, And so we know and rely on what? And so we know and rely on what? The love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will be confident on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Our obedience is a reflection of our love for God. Do you know God? Step one. If you know God, then you should by default rely on God. The fear that's in our hearts. And this is real. I can relate to this. There are, there are things that I'm not as fearful on because I'm like, all right, we good. We, we've run past that. But there's always a mountain in our lives that God uses to bring us closer to him. Right. To give us that opportunity to obey, not out of punishment, not out of fear, but out of love. Right. Like, God, you've done so much for me. It's nothing to share with my family. It's nothing to give my heart. It's nothing to pour myself into what you've called me to do, right. into this sphere of influence so that others may be saved, so that others may receive the same love that I've got. This is an awesome opportunity. This is an awesome chance that we need to recognize in our own lives that we get to rely on the literal creator of the universe. Right. right? This isn't like you relying on your dad. Your dad is awesome. Your mom is awesome. <laughs> But we're talking about God right, right. now. This is, this is the person that made you. Right. And for that reason, we get to operate in a sense of confidence, in yeah. faith, as opposed to fear. Yeah. In Romans 10, we speak even further to this. In verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That is your go. The good news that you need to bring to the next person in your life. That is your go. That opportunity to go about your life and, and just kind of do so complacently, complacently is right there. But the opportunity to, to have beautiful feet some of y'all might not like your toes. <laughs> but God says you got some beautiful feet if you're bringing the good news to those around you. Yeah. And this is, this is an amazing thing that we get to, to not only be saved, but help others be saved yeah. as well. And, and this only comes when we take hold of the faith that we have in Christ mm -hmm. and not shrink back mm -hmm. in our fear. Yeah. Point number three. We need to make the most of our testimony. Yeah. Going back to Acts 22, 
from verse 22 through 25, it says, The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks, and flinging dust into the air. Side note, as I was reading this, I'm like, they were so dramatic back then. Right. True. Like, you, like, taking dirt and, like, throwing it in the air. Like, he's blasphemy. Right. Throwing their clothes up. It was serious to them. Mm-hmm. The commander noticed, the, the, com- the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Mm-hmm. He directed that he be flogged mm-hmm. and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? The plot has now thickened. Roman citizen, wait, hold on, hold on. The Roman citizens were like cream of the crop to the Roman troops. Right? It's the equivalent of being in another country as an American. I don't know if you've ever watched the news, but if you've ever seen an American on foreign soil get played with, it's crazy. Yeah. Right? The embassy gets involved. The armed forces gets involved. We're coming in and we're protecting our people. Right. And the troops here saw a similar sentiment. Right? That we just smacked up this dude that's an actual citizen mm. of Rome. Yeah. And making the most of your testimony means leaving no stone unturned. Mm. Right. right? It, it's almost as though like the spirit was like, yo, mention that you're a Roman citizen. Right. That's like the last thing you could throw out there. Mm. And it worked. They stopped. And, it, and what God allowed that to be <laughs> was an opportunity for his, his journey to be prolonged. Mm. Right? Because... As, we, as we'll read later in, verse, in chapter 23, Paul was actually meant to speak the gospel to Rome. Yeah. Right now he's in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. but he's, he's not only in his hometown right now in Jerusalem, he's meant to go back mm-hmm. to the place in which he's a citizen mm-hmm. as well. So he's pulling out all the stops. Mm-hmm. I know you're beating me, but look, I'm a Roman citizen. Mm-hmm. God's like, you got a job to do, and I'm going to send you to Rome. Amen. And he maximized his testimony, right? Yeah. The fullness of his life. In our, in our lives specifically as well, there are going to be moments where you might be specifically sharing the gospel. You might be specifically using your life as a vessel for people to see. But sometimes it takes opening your mouth, yeah. right? It takes opening your mouth and sharing your story mm-hmm. on a deeper level for people to understand, like, yo, he's not that different than me. Right. Man, she's... she's it's gone through the same thing. We had a similar household background. Right. Or dang, I didn't know. I didn't just by looking at you, I didn't think you right. went through that. I didn't yeah. think you had those hurts. I didn't yeah. think you had that so, pain. Mm-hmm. Paul was able to relate in this way, but mm-hmm. takes his testimony a step further by squeezing every last drop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm a Roman citizen. Mm-hmm. I'm a Pharisee. Mm-hmm. I'm a Jew. It's like, man, dang, what aren't you? Right? He was all things to all people. Yeah. And it really was shown in his ability to, to express that yeah. at every moment that he was faced with a trial. Yeah. And in our lives, we have to imagine the same thing and act on it. How many more people could we touch yeah. if we just opened our mouths yeah. and got over ourselves? Right. I think that's a, that's a huge obstacle mm-hmm. in the end of the day. Paul could have very well been bitter and they beat me up and I'm a Roman citizen. He could have been thinking that in his mind. But instead, he opened his mouth, right? He shared the fullness of who he really was. And God used that as an opportunity to prolong his journey and stop the flogging, which I'm sure was a nice little plus as well. In Revelation chapter 12, let's, let's really see the power of our testimony here as the word describes it. Starting from verse 10 in chapter 12, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. 
for the accuser, that is Satan, mm -hmm. of our brothers and sisters, that's you, mm -hmm. who accuses them day and night, has been hurled down. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Yeah. They triumphed over him. But how? By the blood of the Lamb mm -hmm. and by the word of their testimony. Yeah. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. See, guys, our testimony can shake up a room. Yeah. Right? You really have to believe that. Your testimony can shake up a room. And all the things that are a byproduct of your testimony are a living witness to the people around you. Like, yo, Amen. this isn't because he like worked something out. Right. This isn't because he read some nice self-help book. This isn't because she bought that nice dress. No, this is because of the blood of the lamb Amen. and the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. I know for me, like at work, I'll try to drop God in every little thing. Bro, like, you so fly. It's like, bro, God just be giving me these cool little, you know? Right. Or like, they'll see my stuff on like Instagram and I'm like, I'm dating my awesome girlfriend, Katie. It's like, okay. hey, how, how did I do it? God, bro. Cause a lot of the stuff I didn't plan. A lot of the stuff, I can't put you on game in the way you think, right? This had everything to do with my testimony. This had everything to do with what God worked within me. And in the same way, it does take us. We need to do a, 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 a nice roll call, yeah. right, in our own lives of what God has done. Yeah. You're not just sitting here by your own might, by your own power. God has done specific things that are lined up in our testimony that we need to share more often. And, and while Paul was staring death in the face, he shared his testimony all the more boldly. Right? Imagine us. We're, we're just doing it to the people around us. Yeah. We're just doing it to you know, people that are on the street with us. Paul was doing this knowing that he might die yeah. and was bolder than many of us, if not all of us. Right? We want to be able to one day leave this earth knowing that we had no regrets mm -hmm. and sharing the fullness of our lives and sharing the fullness of our testimony. And honestly, this doesn't even just go with those that we meet. This goes with those in the kingdom as well. There are so many people that don't understand what Matthias had to go through to be, be where he is. There's so many people that don't know that Annalisa is a whole like chef. There's so many people that don't know that Christian is a whole like soccer player. That, that, that Patrick's love of jazz goes beyond many people that I know. Right? There's so many things that God can use to relate to your own brother and sister. Right? And sometimes we can get so caught up in our own trials, we can get so caught up in our own head that we forget, yo, this is a family affair. Right? We have other people doing life with us, walking alongside us. And you're seeing your brother, you're seeing your sister, and they're down and they're struggling. Share with them what you went through. And the fact that you're sitting across from them, sharing that, is encouraging to them. Because yeah. I can look and say, dang, you're 12 years old in the faith, and you went through this at year three. I'm a year, I'm, I'm year two. You know what I'm saying? And now you can come out of that knowing, like, wow, this isn't impossible. Right? This isn't something that I can just victimize myself in. And it gives you a harder head. Because you're like, you know what? If Stephen can do it, I can. Right? If Antoine can do it, I can do it. Yeah. If Mateo can do it, I can do it. If Anne can do it, I can do it. That's exactly what happens when we share our testimony even within the kingdom. Yeah. Point number four. <laughs> Expect God to do the rest. In verse 30 of Acts 22, it says... The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. 
Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. Paul had a clear conscience because he accepted the call from the beginning. When Jesus spoke to him from heaven, that was the clearest sign that he needed, that he was chosen by the Father. This was the clearest sign that he needed, that this life is greater than me. And because he embraced that call, he was able to say with confidence, I've done everything I've needed to do. And I, he looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, with a clear conscience, I've done my duty for God. Amen. Mind you, these are, these are men that were transfixed with the law. God, you dare disrespect God? The next verse, they slap Paul in the mouth for even uttering those words. But Paul, knowing who his salvation is in, Paul, knowing who his confidence is in, Paul, knowing where his home is, said, I'm going to still stand right here, knowing that I've done everything I need to do for God. And God willing, that will be our testimony as well, that we can yeah. say, I ran the race, Absolutely. right? And, and what that is also signific signifying is that he knew God was going to do the rest, mm -hmm. right? If I did everything I can do, <laughs> just like, God, you, you're going to have to come through. You're going to have yeah. to wrap the rest of this thing up because right. I've, done, I've done my part. And you have a lot of promises about what happens if I do my part. Right. And we're going to read a couple of those. In Mark chapter 10, in verse 29. You love a Bible study still? Yeah. All right, just making sure. It says, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Mm -hmm. We have a home in heaven, y'all. Mm -hmm. yeah. But even while we're here on earth, yep. Jesus promises mm -hmm. that what you give up for him, he will a hundred times that. Yeah. What you lay down at his feet, he will multiply. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is, sis. And we need, to, we need to embrace that more. Because a lot of times we, we get selfish. Yeah. We get stubborn. Yeah. I've, been a, you know, I've been victim to that myself, right? Where you, know, you, you want to hold on to that thing that when you start to come to your senses, like, God gave me this in the first place. Yeah. He could snap his fingers and everything I have is gone. Yeah. Or you could choose the side of righteousness and get a hundred times more. And this ain't no prosperity gospel. This is Jesus' right. words. Right. What you lay down for me, I will multiply for you. Not only in this age, but in eternal life Amen. to come. That's like a win-win, right? We're only doing ourselves a disservice by not expecting God to do what he's going to do as in accordance with this scripture. The other thing that he mentions, right, in that little hyphen is persecution as well right so seeing Paul he could have easily been like God I don't deserve this I've done I've done my duty I've gone the lengths I've traveled I've done all these things why am I experiencing this it's like yo you, did you read the fine print it ain't even fine print it's right there right. along with right. persecution mm -hmm. and there was something amazing that um, it was during a staff meeting I remember Taylor Taylor had mentioned that Jesus came to, to give us, as scripture says, life to the full, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And 
to think that life to the full doesn't also include persecution mm. and hardship alongside the good things mm. is is a almost like a deceiving of yourself. Yeah. Mm. Right? And honestly, that was the first time I ever lived. I'm like, dang, that's crazy. Mm. This whole time I've been thinking life to the full is just like abundance. Mm. Everything good, everything great. You get a car, you get a car. It's like, no, persecution as well. Yeah. Hardship as well. If Jesus went through it, you will too, right? We may not get hung up on a cross, but there's so much that we go through that sometimes if we realize this verse, we can be calm in our souls, right? We can, be, we can have the peace that God promises, not as the world gives, but as he gives. Because we know that, yo, you did say, you did say you was going to give me life to the full. Right. And if I decided to say yes to you, God, I'm, I'm willing. Yeah. I'm available. I'm ready. Because I know on the flip side of this, you're going to give me 100x. Amen. In Romans 8, and this will be our last verse for today. In verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, if God is for us, who, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him? Graciously give us all things. God is for us, y'all. God is for us, y'all. There's absolutely nothing on earth that can keep you from the love of God. Paul is a prime example. He literally says that Jesus came to die for sinners of which I am the worst. Mm -hmm. Those are Paul's words. Yeah. So God sees your sin, and while at one point it was in opposition to him, he's now like, welcome home. Yeah. Welcome home, daughter. Yeah. Welcome home, son. I have something way greater than that stuff you was playing around with. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that can stand in the way of what I have in store for you. That is what our expectation has to be, that God is going to finish the rest. I'm going to do my duty. I'm going to set the goals. I'm going to go after it with my whole heart. And God, I know you're going to do the rest. I have confidence in you, not in myself, not in our works, but in the Holy Spirit's ability to fill me up with the strength to go out and do the things that God has called me to do. So with that, after our four points, if you take Okay. The first okay. letters okay. of each point, okay. you have a special word worth holding on to. Mm. If you hear the call of heaven, mm. you get H. Okay. If you operate in obedience, mm. you get O. Okay. If you make the most of your testimony, you get M. Mm. And if you expect God to do the rest, you get E. Okay. Family, that's our home, yeah. right? Nice. Let's always remember that our true yeah. home is in heaven. Yeah. And in knowing that, we can then have the confidence, we can now have the boldness, we can now have the faith to go back to our homes and transform it the same way that Paul did in Jerusalem, the same way he did in Rome, will be the same in our own lives as well. I love you all, and to God be the glory. Come on, brother.